you ready? Alright! Ken, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, start the presentation. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Ken. My nickname is Power Cycle. And uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, notice deploying, specifically uh, scanning and pivoting. Uh, first off, about me. I usually hang out on the FNet on all the uh, uh, open source uh, chat channels. My favorite is OpenWRT, which is run on uh, this router here and a couple of the others. I highly recommend, if you're not doing anything, get involved in OpenWRT and start playing around with it. There's nothing as cheap, as simple, as easy to screw up and bring back to life as that. Um, basically, for the last three years, I've been a DDoS defense engineer. So I've been defending against botnets, writing firewall rules, analyzing networks, um, stuff like that. So I do a lot of stuff like on the wire. Um, a lot of the other developers are much better at the actual exploits about popping a specific box. My view of it is mostly just what's on the wire and what's on the network. So um, the three things I want to talk about are uh, NMAP, DB Autopong, and pivoting. And um, Basically, this is the uh, the scenario that any hack goes through when you're uh, popping a box. Uh, basically, footprinting is figuring out who you want to attack, whether it be like the Brown Hotel, you would just say, you don't even know what their IP address is, you just know <coughs> who you're targeting. Foot scanning is figuring out who they are, what IPs they've got registered to them, what their uh, website is, things like that. So once you get to in scanning and enumeration, um, that's it, essentially what NMAP is. NMAP will only tell you what the IP address is and it will try to figure out what service is running on that port. NMAP does not do any exploit at all. Um, and it's very focused on that. The reason um, I use NMAP, uh, and a lot of people do, is it's free. It's free for personal use, it's free for commercial use. Nessus is another great scanner. It's arguably better than NMAP, um, but it's only free for personal use. If you try to use it in a corporate environment, it's like $1,000 per license. Um, NMAP has a lot of scripting in it that you can try to specifically figure out if you've got a specific service that you're looking for and you want to do a specific test to test for that service, you can add scripts to NMAP. It, it is really, really large. Um, but the uh, gaining access, the escalation, the back door, is really what Metasploit is. Um, really having the two things together is what works. If you don't know what you're going to exploit, if you don't know who to exploit, uh, Metasploit won't give you anything. This is why Metasploit specifically imports in-map data. You can in-map from anywhere, save that file as an XML file, bring it back to your Metasploit uh, point, and then import it. So you don't have to do the scan from the box. You can take scans that you've accumulated over a week, bring them back, load them in the database, and then try to exploit them. Um, okay. This is uh, this first command is sudo in maps with an Apple, a Mac, uh, Apple TCP trace. I won't read the whole thing right now, but um, this is the example of my ultimate uh, in map scan. Um, the, uh, I've got these uh, two slides here. All of these down at the bottom explain exactly what each of those options are. So I'll take some time to, to go through it all. Um, first off, you want to run nmap as the root user. If you don't run sudo nmap or run it as root, you cannot do a stealth scan on a, TC, on a, on a TCP system. The reason is, a regular user is not allowed to talk directly to the interface. The root user is allowed to talk directly to the interface. The root user can override the TCP stack. If you all know what the three-way handshake is for, for a TCP session, you have your SYN, your SYNAC, then you have the ACK, then you push something, you ACK the other side, then you FIN, FINAC, FINAC, FIN, and you close. Any regular program that, you're, you, that you use is not allowed to violate the TCP stack. NMAP specifically violates it so that the other system never gets a fin. That's essentially what the uh, dash SS on there, which says uh, this stealth scan. 
if you have monitoring on the network or specifically monitoring on that port, on that host, many monitoring uh, software, especially if it's on the uh, kernel itself, for instance, if it's Apache that you're running, Apache is not going to know that the port was open for port 80 if no data ever comes to the port. If no data ever comes to the port, then nothing gets logged. If nothing gets logged, then no one knows you scan them. This is the reason you run it at, as root. This is also the reason when you run MSF console, you need to run pseudo MSF console so that you're running as root if you run nmap from inside that. You cannot break the TCP stack unless you root. Um, that's, that right there is probably the most important option. Um, but I'll go through, uh, through some of the others and tell you how and why. Um, the first is the uh, spoof MAC address. Nmap will let you spoof just about anything. You can spoof IP addresses and also spoof your MAC. And you can say, just give me a random Apple. You can, you can say, give me a random Linux, a random Windows, or you can specify a MAC address if you want to spoof something specific. Um, there are some problems with this when you're when you're scanning. I've had it work and not work, so sometimes I take it off, sometimes I, I don't. But it's only for the local LAN. Whoever's whoever's your DHCP server is going to be logging your MAC address. If you've got a scan and you spoof something else, then it's it becomes much more confusing. Um, but basically, that's the first step. You want to obfuscate who you are locally. Um, the second is trace route. Because I do so much networking, I run a trace route on basically every IP address I analyze and look at. Nmap will include in its output the trace route to you. Um, here locally, because we're just one hop away from everything, it really doesn't matter. But if you're in Detroit and your target's in Dallas, it's a really good idea to know what's between you, especially the hop right before your target. Because as soon as you pop the target, you want to turn around and pivot and look at Who's the router that controls that IP address? Where did he get his stuff from? And who else is that router controlling? Um, next one, data length nine. Um, in an effort to hide its scan, Nmap will add extra data on the end of any packet it sends to confuse any analyzer that's trying to read those packets. Um, the data length is how big the random bytes are on the end of it. Um, you can set it for anything, just from my experience. If I added nine on it, that would fill out an entire TCP packet um, without making a second packet for that one scan that I was doing. Um, the next option, dash F, goes along perfectly with the data length. What I'm trying to do is fill an entire packet without going over that. But then dash F cuts up those packets into eight byte segments. Um, it's essentially like setting your MTU to like 400. Normal MTUs are uh, 1600, 1500, something like that. Um, what you're doing is if the IDS has profiles for the scans that you're doing, especially if you're scanning scripts, um, if you've got a script that scans for a particular port or something like that, um, you can have your IDS sit there and look for these, these packets that come in. If you do a dash F, it's going to splice up your packets. Unless the IDS on the other side recompiles all of the packets, it's not going to see the signature. Um, <coughs> next option, dash uh, D. These are for decoys. This is where Nmap, uh, its ability to spoof IP addresses, comes in pretty handy. Even though you're doing a stealth sin, stealth, uh, sin scan of the target, um, you're still going to try to, to uh, when you find an open port, you're still going to try to verify that port. You're still going to, to try to verify what OS it is, other things. So there's going to be some trace that you scan the box no matter what. What the decoys allow you to do is throw a bunch of other IPs and requests at the same box so that you become one of six scans, or you can become one of a hundred scans, basically any number you want to. Um, so uh, what I've done here is, on the first IP address where it says 200-200, <coughs> I 
that's an example of setting an IP address. <coughs> if, um, if I'm a hacker on the network and I know Brian's on the network and I want to get Brian in trouble, I can scan Adrian's server with Brian's IP address. All of the logs will show that he did it. I can come back later and do it, do it a different way, but it, it's an example of how you can speci specify what's going on. Um, the comma random colon five tells Metasploit to come up with five random IP addresses. Um, it will not come up with private IP addresses. It will come up with real IP addresses. So when you do this, understand that the, the server that you hit is going to be responding to the random IP addresses. And that's probably not a, a good thing, especially if you keep scanning, keep scanning, keep scanning. You're going to be causing an act flood, basically a really low-level act flood, to whoever the random targets happen to be. Um, the uh, next comment, it says me. If you read in the Nmap uh, man pages on uh, this, it basically says that on some IDSs, particularly uh, some microsystems IDS, that if it has more than six IP address scans, it will not record the seventh IP address. So by specifically declaring the first six IP addresses in the decoys and then, and then telling Nmap put me at the seventh position, you're more likely not to be even logged if there is a logger there. Um, the uh, next options. Dash D, just for most, most like everything else. Dash N. Um, N tells Nmap not to resolve any of the IP addresses. Well, one of my, one of the things I hate is looking at a TC, looking at a trace route where only the host name has been resolved, and it's got a bunch of codes that mean something to another carrier, to another network administrator, and I don't know what the codes mean. What I really care about is the actual IP address. It's the only thing I care about. If I want to look it up later, I'll look it up. But if I'm going to run 25 scans and then come back later and look at it, it could be a month later, it could be three months later, the names could have changed, and I may not be able to resolve those anymore. If I just tell them that from the beginning, don't even worry about it, just give me these straight IPs, it's much simpler to work with. Um, dash O is for uh, OS detection. Once you get at least uh, two open ports and one closed port, then Nmap can figure out whether it's Linux, whether it's Apple, whether it's uh, Microsoft, or uh, uh, any OS. That dash A will actually do advanced OS detection as well. So it'll, you can do even more depth, it's a little slower. But okay. All right. All right. This, this, there's some uh, flags that you use, like the uh, stealth options or for us, like throwing in decoys for make it look like Brian attack instead of you. If you throw in the wrong options, it does actually show you as different in the logs because it does a full connection for some things. Like if you do fingerprinting, it, exactly. unfortunately, it has to talk directly to it. Exactly. Um, when you're, when you're doing the stealth SIM scan, you're scanning all of the ports, but you're not opening and closing or trying to open and close all of those individual ports. When you have an open port and you're trying to verify the actual service that's running on it, you have to make a full connection. You actually have to push some data to get some sort of data back. So in those cases, yes, that comes there. But if, if you're scanning a 1,000 ports, it's better to only leave three pieces of evidence that you were there instead of a thousand. That, that's the idea. I was thinking of you impersonating someone else, or if you were spoofing someone else. They looked in the log, they'll see that his was only sins, but someone else's was full connects, because they yeah. had to do the full connect to actually do the fingerprint. Yes, exactly. Yes. So it, the, part, of the point is, part of the point of the decoys is anticipating that somebody's going to see something. So if they're going to see something, then give them more data to just hide what's going on. So my, my point is just kind of get you out to a lot of the different options and you can piece together whatever is best for you. Uh, okay. Before I go to the next slide, has anybody got any questions about these particular options? Yeah. When you're doing the dash up with the fragment and uh, the data link to do the padding on the end of that, is that using the sequence number and actually doing sequence chopping to bring it, like if you got a packet link, does it chop back the sequence number to put them back together? It's not the sequence number. The sequence number is the packet itself. Oh, yeah. But but then what the TCP stack does is it whatever data you give to the TCP stack 
it tries to fit it as much as it can in one packet. The size of a packet is determined by an MTU, something transmission unit. Uh, uh, but whatever that size is, um, whatever the limit for the interface is, you don't have to send at that limit. So even though my, my, my MTU may be 1500, I can set it to 1200, I can set it to 800, I can set it to anything. So what it's doing is, when, you, when you're fragmenting, you're chopping it up into four pieces, you're sending them out, the, the, the interface on the other side is gonna wait until all four packets come in. Because eat, the first three packets, if there's four slices, let's say, the first three packets will say, I'm a fragment, I'm a fragment, I'm a fragment. The fourth packet will say, I'm a packet. And then they'll, they'll all be reassembled, and then that service will then receive the data that was in the TCP. Does it actually pad anything on that, though, or does it just Data link 9 puts extra data on that packet. Okay, does that actually chop back the sequence number to bring those back together? Dash, dash F slices that packet. Okay. I'd ask your question. What was the... So when you pad the packet, if you're padding packets, you're going to have junk data sitting in between your normal data. Right. Does it use the sequence number to try to chop those back together to do like a, the packet fragmentation kind of uh, push your data back together so you know junk data sitting or no ops or whatever? Um, well, InMap knows what's junk when it when it sends its stuff out, and for most of it, <coughs> most of it is not even going to be. If there is a response. InMap is not really looking for what did the service tell me. It's looking for what sort of response did I get off the port. Did I get a reset or did I get a, uh, a, an ACK? Um, so the purpose of adding the extra data on there is if someone were PCAPing the network, okay, and they had a, a, a perfect uh, a flow of what went through, then reassembling all those packets in a decoder would be pretty easy. If you're adding extra data onto it, then it becomes harder for the encoder to figure out there was something here. So then the analyzer is going to try to figure out, trying to reconfigure what that data was. But there's no data; it's just random. It's just it's it's mostly just a decoy again. You're you're not really it doesn't do anything for the scan itself. It's just only if someone sees this scan. Um, if they look at it, uh, if they're watching your IP address specifically, if you're just sending a sin and then you close a sin and you close a sin and you close and you, and you never actually send any data, there's never any bulk over it, then it's pretty easy to see that it's just a scan. If there's actual data, even if it's a small amount that's in the packets, then it will at least look like it's a more legitimate transfer. Okay. So the, the whole reason for putting it on there is just to camouflage. Um, so the, the, the stealth part of it is really, you're not even closing, closing the ports properly. But when you have to send some data, like when you're trying to, have to analyze a, a service and you see port 80, you're trying to figure out is it a patch or is it ISSI. Um, when you send something there, there are a lot of uh, rules which say if there's no data in the packet that comes in, then don't even look, allow it to get to, to the web server itself. So by putting something in there, you you satisfy the rule of I'm trying to push some data. Let me let me get a response. And the web server may say this data doesn't make any sense. Tell them, you know I'm an ISS machine. I'm running this version. Please please format your request in this. InMap looks at the response, the error code of the response from its bogus data to figure out what's going on. How do you uh, how do you hide your IP so that basically have to go get on some network, just some random network, just so they wouldn't have You have to have a legitimate IP to, to receive back the, the information. So you just have to end up going to a coffee shop or something to hide yourself from um, that point of view, I guess. Well, if uh, if you talk to uh, Fyodor, the guy that wrote InMap, um, I read a, a couple of his uh, interviews. There's specifically an interview on InMap, um, which he says... He knows of no law which can prevent you from scanning a network. There's nothing wrong with doing an in-map or doing anything. Spooking a bunch of IP addresses would be you know, not really nice, but 
technically there's nothing wrong with scanning. And there's been put to somewhat of a test. Though someone, some companies still come and talk to you and so forth. There was a guy named Scott Moulton who actually was, to my knowledge, the first person to ever have uh, someone come after him legally because of uh, of uh, end mapping. He was uh, actually doing the testing. The company was paying him, and he still ended up getting arrested. Mm-hmm. That was a few years back. But if, like, for instance, if you were to go to a coffee shop and start scanning from your coffee shop, I would think there's some terms of service of using their network. Um, I, I run servers at, uh, in, in data centers, and, and those don't particularly, they, don't, they just don't have agreements for things like that because it's just commonly done. It's commonly done. I need to test whether my firewall is, is up and actually working. Um, so scanning from somewhere, you don't necessarily need to hide yourself. If you were here and you're trying to, to connect, you jump on the, the Brown network, scan everything they have, and then disconnect and maybe come back later, come back with another exploit from another IP address and, and attack from another vector. Or just exploit it as quick as you can and get out. So it, it's, it, it kind of fits on where you are. But you have to have a IP address, but you don't have to be on the same network. You just have to have access to those, to those IPs. And what you're really trying to figure out is if I'm in Detroit, on a server in Detroit, and I'm scanning the, the Brown Hotel network, what can I see from that point of view? What's accessible from outside? And then when I come in here and I scan them from inside, what's accessible from the inside? And then pivoting becomes the example of what you can come inside and then turn and then get everybody else. Get back out again. Okay. I guess I was trying to figure out how you disassociate the IP you scan with from the IP that you eventually connect with where you do cross that legal boundary? Um, that, that would be when you start, when you run MSF console and when you start the exploit, that is specifically attacking someone's other box maliciously. Of course, for the sake of this class, we'd only be attacking boxes that we've been hired to penetrate, do a penetration test on. Right, right. But, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to understand the mindset of how you would disassociate those two IPs from each other. So you have to switch over to a different network. Well, once you have the end map for doing it fast and finding out what's out there, you can maybe connect through with like a Tor network or I2P or some other like dark net and connect out or possibly move to another coffee shop. If you were so inclined to be black hat. Right. So you just walk down the street. <laughs> but essentially, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Okay. Um, okay. Some of the other stuff. Uh, dash SS, I said stealth sets can. SV um, means that when Inmap finds an open port, is to do a version test on that port. If it finds port 22, it's going to try to figure out which version of SSH is running there. If it's running port 21, it's going to try to figure out which FTP. Usually, if you just connect and say quit, whatever service is running on that port is going to tell you outright what it's running. Um, so it's not... Like a banner driver or something like that? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Usually, if you... If you tell bad information to a program, the program will tell you, I am this. And in, in the, the logical aspect of, if you thought you were run, talking to an ISS server and you issued a command based on a, a Linux server, the ISS is not going to understand it. And then its error code is going to tell you, as a reminder, by the way, I'm Windows and I'm not Linux. Or, by the way, I'm uh, OpenSSH or I'm DSFT. Um, okay, so it's going to do the version scan. The uh, next one, dash OA. This is the difference between Metasploit and Nmap. Um, dash OA tells I want the output, and the A says I want all the output. There are three uh, files that Nmap will create. One is a .nmap, one <coughs> is a .grep, and one is .xml. The uh, XML is the only file that Metasploit will import, so it's the one you care about the most. Um, <clears throat> for me, I just always name the name of the file, the IP address that I'm scanning. So that's what uh, dash is away from our site on Exploit. All right, dash dash log errors. Um, usually you don't get anything, but if there is something in my script, I wanted to go ahead and tell me what it is. And like I said, if I'm running 25 different scans of something, I don't want to have to go back on my screen to figure out where it is. I want to save the output every single time. Also, 
maybe cases where I rescan the same IP multiple times. So I pin the output. So if it's done on Monday and I scan it again on Wednesday and I scan it again on Friday, I don't overwrite the same data or the old data. Because it may be very interesting if there was no FTP port open on Tuesday and now it is open on Wednesday. Um, the next one. Okay, dash P is the ports that you want to scan. Uh, if you put a capital T and a colon in front of that, then it tells it, I only want to do a TCP scan. In a lot of different cases, depending on what's going on, how you uh, do it, the more verbose the scan, the more Nmap will try TCP, UDP, and ICMP to try to figure out what's going on. For Metasploit, you're basically going to exploit and then get a shell back to you, and then you're going to do something with that shell. That shell is going to re require TCP connection. So I only want to look for TCP ports. I don't really care if there's a UDP port out there. It may be great for something else, but for for actually setting up an interpreter session back to yourself, you have to have TCP, so why not only look for TCP to begin with? Um, and here's where you declare the ports. So 1 through uh, 1024 just says I want to do every, every port in that range, and then you just do commas where you can uh, uh, specifically add other ports if you know you've got an exploit for uh, 1433, or you know that your target always runs a uh, internal proxy on uh, 2222 or something like that. Um, then the uh, last line is randomized hosts and the uh, two targets that you might want to run against. Randomized hosts um, takes any uh, targets that you're going to and then just alternatively picks one and does it. Um, for this particular uh, scan where you're declaring so many decoys, I really suggest that you don't scan an entire subnet because with this you're going to create seven times the amount of traffic because of the extra decoy traffic. Um, but I wanted to put randomized hosts in just to give you an idea that um, if, you're, if you've got a whole collection of IP addresses that you want to, to go through, you just got them out of a, a grab bag out of a box and you don't really know where to, where to, step, where to start or stop. Um, and if someone is looking at you on the other side and you have an, a, a perfectly enumerated list of connections, then it's going to be much more obvious when somebody looks at the logs to say one was scanned, then two was scanned, then three was scanned, then four was scanned. If you just totally mix it up, it's going to be much, much harder for anyone to put together what you're doing. Um, okay, for Nmap, any questions about the switches, options, or anything? In case anybody is wondering, uh, we're currently booting the XP box. Another exploit hitting something, yeah, things crash, things go kablooey. <laughs> so we'll be booting it so people, if they want to try some of the attacks, hopefully it'll be back up shortly. Sorry, go ahead. All right, um, okay. <clears throat> inside the inside, uh, Metasploit, the command to import a file name. So if you're if you're doing your own nmap command, you do uh, dash oa and you declare the output. Then here is where you can import that. So it's just a simple command: db underscore import underscore nmap underscore xml, and then the uh, file name. A couple things uh, to remember: nmap only does the host and the ports. And for instance, like I said, I love to see the trace route. Metasploit doesn't include the trace route in what it imports. There's some other little extra information, such as uh, Nmap tries to guess the operating system, and it uh, will sometimes give you a percentage guess of what it thinks the operating system is. Uh, Metasploit, for the most part, doesn't import any of that. If it does import something, then it throws it into DB notes. Only if you import an Nmap scan do you get anything in DB notes. If you run Nmap from inside Metasploit, it doesn't put anything there with the exact same options. So here is the uh, Nmap command, which, as you can see, it starts with DB underscore Nmap. If you're inside MFS console, and you run the command this way, and I put the, it's the exact same options as before. But if you run db underscore nmap, 
then Metasploit will spawn the MMAP, it'll do the scan for you, and it will import everything and put it into its database of hosts without having to do the, the extra step of, in, of import. Um, it, as I said, only gives you the hosts and the ports, or as MMAP calls them, services. Um, and there's a, some, some extra information that's just not saved. So uh, I like to run MMAP separately and do the import. But there you go. Okay. Um, when you import, you're going to import into a database. The uh, first thing you need to do with uh, Metasploit is declare what type of database you want to use. I like to use SQLite because it puts the file in the home directory. It doesn't, you don't need a uh, SQL server or a Postgres server or anything else up and running. If you just declare SQLite 3, the file will be there on your, in, in your uh, home directory. You can pick that file up, uh, SCP it to another uh, Metasploit, um, uh, install, import everything really quickly, and it is encrypted. If you just, uh, when you first start Metasploit, if you just say db underscore create, it will create its own database. Um, and then it will start throwing everything in there. Or you can declare what database you want to work with. So if you have a, uh, a list of Kentucky IP addresses or Kentucky uh, targets, and you've got a different list for Ohio targets. You can keep them in completely separate databases. Um, if you have all Windows targets in one database, Linux targets in another database, however you serve. But anyway, you just declare, give it a name. Um, there's no passwords or anything that you need to keep up inside of Metasploit. But, uh, um, so it, it will do that all for you. Um, so, once you create the database, it's already loaded. If you exit out of, out of Metasploit and come back into Metasploit and you've already got your database there, then all you need to declare is db underscore connect. That will connect you to the, to the default database you set up. Or, if you save a specific one, you just say connect to whichever database. With SQLite, it's really easy because the database are in, in the uh, Metasploit uh, directory. Once you've done your scan, um, once you've imported all of that information, now you get to look at it through the, uh, the Metasploit point of view. The two most important things are DB hosts and DB services. If you just declare DB hosts, then it will show you all of the hosts that it has in its database. If it's only one, it'll show you one. If it's 100, it'll show you all 100. If you declare which IP address you want to look for, like you're saying you want to look to see what info is on this host, then you say DB underscore hosts, space, that particular IP address. And uh, if you want options, just DB hosts, space, dash H. Metasploit is really good about almost any command you want to run. If you just do dash H, you can figure out what it is. It's the the, uh, the info is really tightly wound inside, so you don't have to back out to something else to, to read a man page or something. It's all inside the console. Um, and then the, down at the bottom it says available columns. That is all the different information that it's basically pulling from Nmap and then telling you so that you can sort. If you've done a scan, you, you didn't know which ones were Windows boxes or which ones were Linux. You can sort your, your database right here by just saying dash C and then specifying the column, um, plus some stuff. DB underscore services is the ports that are open on the hosts that you scanned. So if I say DB services on this IP address, it's going to tell me the five, seven, or, or however many ports you have open. Um, it's also going to tell you 
what vulnerabilities line up to the ports that are open, if you have anything that's exploitable that you've already scanned. So, once you've done the scan and uh, you want to exploit the box, this is where uh, uh, DB Autopom comes into play. These uh, are the options for uh, select the vulnerabilities scan by the ports that are open, um, tell you everything that's, that's uh, running, actually exploit it, and then the dash R is for making a reverse shell connect back to you. Dash I declares specifically which host you want to exploit. If you have a database of 100 hosts and you don't specify an IP address, then it will try to exploit every single host in your database. If your own host happens to be in there, then you can specify X or exclude this particular IP. There's also a new feature, too, for rankings. So like based off of an exploit, like for example, when you're doing mass components of a system, there's different category rankings. So you either have like bad, good, or excellent based off of maybe like a demo out service or exploit's kind of shaky and crash the service. You can actually do like an um, a, a excellent ranking. So only fire off exploits that it thinks won't crash the service or not something, which is pretty nice. Um, and uh, also, I, I kind of want to mention here, DB Autopone is not the, really the best way for Metasploit to uh, pop a box. Yeah. Um, it's much better if you know a, a specific vulnerability on the server you're running at. It's much more, uh, it's much less obvious and it's much more sneaky just to run a single exploit and get in. The idea behind DB Autopone and the idea behind Metasploit is it's a framework. So in the context of the framework, all of the exploits are loaded in there, and you just, as a dumb script kitty, just run it. You don't really have to think about what vulnerabilities are open. If you scan and then you run against it, that's all it is. You don't have to know how to get in the box. Um, DB Autopone is not is also it's running so much at the same time. It, like he said, it can really overwhelm the box and overwhelm particular servers. So my uh, my point in, in showing you this is just kind of the uh, of what Metasploit actually it Metasploit can be. Um, if you think back to uh, the I think it was the Melissa virus that was uh, uh, released about ten years ago or something like that. It was actually written in I think thirty minutes. Some some guy had uh, had been to a, a strip club I think came home, downloaded a, uh, a virus creator, some uh, virus creator software, um, and then named it after the distributor he just seen. I hate when I get a virus after getting back from the <laughs> And then <laughs> within, within, literally within 30 minutes of creating it and then releasing it, it owned the entire internet. Um, he didn't mean for it to get back that big. He had no idea what he was even really doing. And that's kind of what I wanted to demonstrate is you don't even have to really know how the exploit works or why the exploit works because Metasploit as a framework allows you to swing back and forth to the parts you do know. Um, if you can get to this point and run this exploit, then you can just keep running and keep running and keep running and, and it doesn't matter. If you've got a server out there, um, you can <coughs> run all day long. You can run, have Nmap continually coming up with random IP addresses to scan, and you could have DB Autopone continually sitting there trying to own every IP that comes up. Um, this, for me, was the most awesome thing about Metasploit. Um, there, there have always been exploits and scripts and different ways of, of exploiting a box or a particular service. Um, and with Metasploit being a framework, it's perfect because you don't have to know each individual step. You don't have to hardwire or uh, change your variables or whatever to get your specific thing working. You just load the exploits. Every week, almost every day, there are new exploits coming out. So you don't even have to know what they are if you just run autopone. Every exploit that you have loaded and downloaded is going to try to hit that target. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, the uh, 
the uh, third thing I wanted to talk about was uh, pivoting. In a uh, networking concept, when you exploit a particular box, there's a chance that that box is going to be able to talk to other boxes that you can't connect to. If you're coming in from the outside of a firewall um, and you get a reverse shell from one particular IP address, and uh, let me say uh, there are lots of different ways that, to connect to somebody. One way might be like a USB key, where you give somebody, they plug it in, they take their laptop, laptop back into the company, open it up, and then that exploit then connects back to you. Unless he connected back to you, there would no way to, be no way to get inside the firewall to get to him. Since he's talking to you, this internal computer has access and can probably see everybody else in the network. So what Metasploit allows you to do is pivot your scans and your exploits from the one internal box you have against everyone else because you can't talk to any of those boxes uh, externally. So once you get a interpreter uh, command line, no matter how you get it, whether it be a social engineering, uh, an actual direct exploit off of it, if you run the script get local sub subnets, then it'll tell you what it can see. Usually it's going to be with some private IP address if it's going to be in some corporate environment. So if you then background that session, go to your MFS console and add a route for the new subnet that you just saw on the box you popped, then any scans you do on that internal subnet will be routed through the box you have already, already have. So from your... You asked uh, earlier about the uh, IP address that the, that the uh, scans are coming from. If you exploit a box internally, and then you, uh, you're basically doing a, a proxy, when you do your scans internally now from this other box, that's the box that's going to show up in all the logs. So it's very easy now. Once you're in this... In this uh, interpreter session, once you're in the MS, MFS console, and you're going to do an nmap scan, you would have to do db underscore nmap in order to be routed through the pivot machine. Um, any questions? Um, this, uh, this was the other thing. And this is the uh, last thing I'm going to talk about for some other stuff, some demonstrations like screen if you want. Um, but uh, just this February, Egypt, who's a uh, metaphoric dev, did a presentation at uh, Black Hat DC about automatic routing through new subnets. The thing I love about DBR components, you don't have to think about it. But once you got, once you pop that box, then you had to manually go through and enter the new route that you just found. So he created a script called auto add route, um, which you can just add with load the load and route, so that when you pop a box, it will automatically add that route to Metasploit. So if you have 25 machines on 25 different uh, different IP addresses, then you could cycle through all of them. You could be automatically scanning, automatically pulling automatically adding the route and then having more IP addresses to scan again. And it becomes a very simple, dumb loop where you don't even have to know the IP addresses. You have to just have to start it off and get lucky with one. Um, so. Uh, yeah. Basically, uh, it's just the route print at the end. We'll show you what your routes are if you've added anything. So that's it for all my commands and switches. Um, let's see. <coughs> This is what uh, DB host looks like. It just gives you the IP address.
addresses and only the IP addresses with the ones you've uh, scanned. Here's all of the services. And then uh, over in this last column, I'll show you what uh, IP address is associated to it. Like I said, if you've got hundreds of IPs in your database, then you just limit it by the IP address or by the port or whatever you like. Um, going through and hitting each port in my list. And I think it's... submachine or to, to um, um, it's giving it bad info. Basically you can see where it says branch foo and tag root and, and uh, 42 options uh, things like that. That should mean nothing to the service that's running on the other side. It is this not the, the bogus data link this is part of the script to figure out what the version is. But um, as it's going through, this is the, this is the sort of stuff that uh, the IDSs are going to be looking for. So the more you can cut it up, that's that's a pretty small packet to uh, begin with. But, uh, this help a lot of this stuff is just in map going back and forth, so um, I don't want to go into to too much of it, but uh, that's basically the most uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about Screen real quick. Want to? Okay. Um, screen is my favorite program of all time. Uh, it's a, a terminal multiplexer that allows you to have multiple terminals running inside the same terminal program. So I can split, I can have up to about 24 different sessions running at the same time off the same box within the same window so you don't have to alt tab through all the different stuff. One of the best things about it is the buffer. So if I switch off to a different screen, then you can scroll back with inside that that screen's buffer. So I think it's set at like 500 right now. But uh, like you were talking about more or less. So if I go to uh, yeah, like I was wanting to easily be able to go. Up, I want to be able to type like help in uh, Metasploit and be able to scroll up easily 
to the stuff above, or better yet, just have it show me one screen at a time, and hit enter the page through them or something. Yeah, I don't know how to do one one screen at a time, but like if I do help here, the screen will let me scroll back very easily to get into it. Okay. And the it's just a control A escape that gets you into the scroll back buffer, and then uh, up and down work, page up and page down work. You can do a reverse search. And it will search up. So if you know a particular word on the line you're looking for, you can look it that way. Um, I've had a uh, screen session with history that is as long as 10,000 lines. So it can be much more than your visual browser, whatever you want to keep track of. And the uh, thing about the buffer is once you close the screen, then it's gone. It doesn't really need to log any of it, um, but it's so far back. I've had. I can, I've had Sessions go on for days. And if you just never close the screen session, you go back to it, you can scroll back and see what went on. If it's small amounts of packets, less than 10,000, whatever. Then you scroll back and see, it'll include all the time steps, it'll include uh, um, everything. So it's really easy. And with the search option, it's really easy to go up and down and figure out. And as long as you know what you're looking for, you can jump directly to it and then just page down. Any questions? Any, uh, anything over anything I uh, talked about?